verses of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Favorite, let us sing. Holy Spirit, dwell in me, Lord. Touch my eyes, then by my sea, and all your goodness, grace, and power. Stay beside me every hour, and be my drink, be my living bread, and keep me sheltered, keep me me fed. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, dwell in me, dwell in me. And the Holy Spirit, comfort me, Lord, let my heart be one with Thee. And when I'm worried, soothe my mind. Let me sweet contentment find, and may I run this regret and filled by your amazing grace, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, comfort me, comfort me, and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, comfort me, comfort me, and the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, comfort me, comfort me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Praise God. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? It's wonderful to see you out here today. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of cold outside, uh, but we are warming up in here because God is in our midst and we are surrounded and enveloped by his people presence. In other words, if God is dwelling in each one of you, then we're going to have a great time today in the Lord. Amen. We are selected for a, a devotional theme. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. I want everybody to stand with me, please, as we uh, begin our worship. It's important to make sure that our hearts are fixed and our minds are focused on God. For he is the object of our worship. He is the very, very, um, uh, we are the apple of his eye. In other words, he loves us and he wants the best for us. And he doesn't do anything that is designed to hurt us. And we get hurt sometimes when we step out of the bounds of his will and his desire. So that's why it's important for us to make sure that we are hearing the word of the Lord. Because God communicates uh, with us uh, through his word, uh, through circumstance, even in his people presence. God has a way of touching our hearts and sensitizing our hearts that we may be able to hear. Uh, with ears of understanding, all right? So I want you to repeat. No, don't repeat. I'm going to do the first section, and then you chime in at the end, okay? Again, as we embrace the theme, hear the word of the Lord, okay? The Lord God says, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Now watch this now. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land and send a plague among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, uh, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Together. Amen. Pray with me. Merciful God, our Father, we uh, humbly approach your throne of grace and mercy, knowing, dear God, that there's no other place that we want to be that is in your presence, surrounded by your love, enveloped by your spirit, uh, embraced by your people, 
that we may collectively offer up sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to you, for you are worthy to be praised. We worship you today. We praise your name for your mighty deeds and your wonderful acts. And even based on your sovereignty, we declare today that you are the Lord our God. And above you there is no other. And so therefore, as we humbly approach you, yet confidently approach you, for we understand that you are our father and we are your children. Yes. And we cry out, Abba, Father, uh, intimately knowing that we are related uh, to you by virtue of our position in Christ Jesus. We don't come before you based on our own righteousness, our own strength, our own piety, our own um, sense of uh, well-being. No, no, it's because of Jesus. Yes that we are able to stand before you. And we understand that our sins are like scarlet, but in Christ, you make our lives as white as snow. Yes. And you have removed uh, the stain uh, that offends. You have given us a new lease on life. You have made us acceptable in the beloved. So today we say, thank you, Lord. We worship your mighty and holy name, for you are worthy to be praised. And even in our own humanness, even as we fall short, uh, it is by faith that we offer up this sacrifice of praise. And we pray to God that the things that we do and say today will be pleasing to you, edifying to the body, informative to the lost, that they may also come to ask the question, what must I do uh, to be saved? So be with us today, dear God, as we worship you um, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we do humbly pray. Amen. I'm going to ask that you remain standing as we begin our devotion. When we reach the city of the new Jerusalem, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. And how the ransom singers, we're together, lift at him. We're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. And oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find a rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. Singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. Yes, in that mighty chorus of voices, we'll so sweetly sing. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. Yes, gone will be our sadness, pleasure. There will never end. Yes, we're going to sing. We're going to sing by and by. And oh, what joy when we get home. Yes, we're going to find a rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. And oh, a joy when we get on. Yes, we're going to find a rest, rest beneath that cloudless dawn. We're singing now in that land where saints will never die. Yes, we're going to sing, we're going to sing by and by. Let us uh, notice when the morning comes, when the morning comes, let us together sing. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eyes, and we'll follow till we die. And we will understand it better by and by. And we're singing by and by, oh, 
when the morning comes and you know all the saints of my God are gathering home and we will tell the story of how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by and we are often destitute of the things that life demands a wonder shelter and a food a thirsty hills and barren land but we're trusting in the lord and according to his word and we will understand it better by and everybody sing by and by oh when the morning comes and you know it all the saints of my god are gathering home and we will tell the story of how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by and we talk on every hand and we cannot understand all the ways that god will lead us to that blessed promised land uh, but he'll guide us with his eyes and we'll follow till we die and we will understand it better by and by everybody sing by and by oh when the morning comes and you know all the saints of my god are gathering home and we will tell the story of how we overcome and we will understand it better by and by as we uh prepare our hearts and minds for communion. Let us notice at the cross. Let us together sing. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die, and would he devote that head for such a and oh, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away, it was there. The church say amen. We now come to the point of our service where we commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in a portion of our service that we call communion or the Lord's Supper. It is now that we prepare our hearts and minds. The Bible says the same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had broken and said, Take eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he had supped, he took the cup, saying, This is the New Testament of my blood. Drink ye all of it. For and often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show my death until I shall come again. Christ said, I shall not eat of this bread and drink of this cup with you until I shall eat and drink of it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. Paul later on says in the book of Corinthians, let every man examine himself. But he that eat of the bread and drink of the cup in an unworthy manner, eat and drink of damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many do sleep. But if we shall judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. It's important for us to remember that 
God gave us the body and the blood of the Lord for us to remember the great gift, the great sacrifice, but also the great love that he had for us in giving his son Christ Jesus. Not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. Throughout all of our sins, throughout all of our shortcomings, throughout all of our issues and our hangups, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that through him the world should not be condemned, but the world should be saved. We thank God for his wonderful sacrifice, understanding that it is only through Jesus that we now have a right standing and relationship with God. For the Bible says your sins have disconnected you or severed your connection with God. But God in his loving majesty and infinite wisdom, while we were yet sinners, sent Christ to die. The Bible says that scarcely for a righteous man would one die. But how much more for a sinner would one die? And that is the gift that we have in Christ Jesus. So as we take of these emblems, we remember that great gift, but we also remember that great love. And now also knowing that the same love that God gave to us, now we are commanded to give to others. The body cannot be broken in the church of Christ. We are called to love one another, to do good works for one another, to uplift one another as the body of Christ is unbroken. So remember that as we partake of these emblems. I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verse number one, and it reads, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. For he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as it were our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and through his stripes we are healed. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your son Christ Jesus, for he is the reason why we are even gathered here today to worship you. We thank you, Father God, for loving us when we were unlovable, for saving us when we were unredeemable. We thank you, Father God, for knowing that your son Christ Jesus would fulfill all the tenets of the law, for knowing that he would live a perfect life for us, that we may now have peace with you. And God, we pray that as we partake of these emblems, we do so with clean hand and pure hearts, always acknowledging your son, Christ Jesus, until he shall come again. And God, may he come again soon. In the name of your son, Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. them by faith to receive my sight and now I am happy all happy all the day the church say amen We've now come to the point of our service where we are commanded to give. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians verses 9 and 6 that he that soweth sparingly shall also reapeth sparingly, but he that soweth bountifully shall also reapeth bountifully. So let every man get if God has purposed him, knowing that God loveth a cheerful giver. The Bible says we are not supposed to give begrudgingly nor of necessity, but give as God has placed it on our hearts. It's important to realize that God is not in need of your financial means. God does not need your tokens or coins, but it is actually for us that we give for the work of maturation that God wishes to do on your heart starts with a giving heart. Just as God gave as his children, we also should walk in the footsteps of God and give as well. The Bible says that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills and the world is his also. But while we are yet here on earth, it's important for us to walk in the footsteps of God. 
The Bible says that there will be many in the last days that will say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not do all these wonderful things in your name? And he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you, right? For your deeds were there, but your heart was far from me, right? Conversely, when he's speaking later on in that chapter, he says, enter into thy kingdom, for you have been faithful over a few things, and let me make you rule over many. And he says, for when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in turmoil, you comforted me. When I was bound, you came to see me. And they say, now when did we do all these things, Lord? And he says, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. God cares how we treat one another. We need to be in the vein of giving to those who are less fortunate and those who need our help today. So as God is working on your heart, let him do a wondrous work in you. Give as God has placed upon your heart, knowing that what you give today will be used for the upbuilding of his kingdom and working right here in our portion of the vineyard. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for all the things that you've given us, what you've blessed us with, our ability to earn and earn uh, these funds in a legitimate way. But God, we pray that you would do a work on our heart, Father God, that we would become more mature in your word. Allow us, Father God, to give as you first gave to us. Allow us, Father God, to make a difference in this community by which we have been planted. We pray, Father God, that we would be a people of giving. That, Father God, that we would not only give to one another, but give to those, Father God, that maybe we haven't even met yet, that they may see our good works and glorify you, which art in heaven. God, we pray that all these things will be done in decency and in order. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Yes, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. And I feel better, so much better. Since I laid my burdens down, yes, I feel better, so much better. Since I laid my burdens down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I lay my burdens down. Friends, don't treat me like they used to, since I lay my burdens down. Yes, friends, don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. A glory, glory, yes, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. For a scripture reading and prayer, let us notice uh, I woke up this morning. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind, and you know it was stay on Jesus. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was stay on the Lord. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know it was J on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church now, I'm singing and praying with my, and you know it was stay on oh, Jesus. Yes, I'm singing and praying with my, and you know it was stay on the Lord. Yes, I'm singing and praying with my, and you know 
we will stay. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church now, I woke up this morning with my, and you know we will stay. Oh, Jesus, yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know we will stay on the Lord. Yes, I woke up this morning with my, and you know we will stay on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Good morning, church. If you're able to, please stand for the reading of the scripture. Today's scripture will be coming from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I will be reading the King James Version. And it reads, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This concludes the reading of this, the scripture. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just like to thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to come and know you and know your commandments. We thank you for your love and for your grace and your mercy. We come to you with open hearts and open minds ready to worship your holy name. We ask that you fill us with your grace and love during this time. And we pray that you bless the sick and the shut-in, and that you bless the speaker of the hour. Crown him with knowledge, so that he may deliver a message beneficial to us and pleasing in your sight. Please show us how to be servants to you. Forgive us of our transgressions, and watch over us as we proceed through our service. We ask all these things in your son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. For the speaker of the hour comes up, let us notice. God is real. You have it. Let us together say. There are some things I may not know. There are some places I, I can go. No, I cannot go. But I am sure. God is real, for I can feel deep in my soul. Oh, don't you know God is real? He's so real in my soul. Don't you know God is real, for he has washed and me whole, and his love for me is just like pure gold. Yes, God is real, for I can feel him in my soul. Oh, and some folks may die. Some folks may scorn. All can go on and leave. Leave me alone. Yes, leave me alone. But as for me, 
I'll take God's stand. And God is real, for I can feel Him in my heart. Well, don't you know God is real? He's so real in my soul. Don't you know God is real? For He has washed and made me whole. And He is love for me. It's just like pure gold. Don't you know God is real? For I can feel Him in my soul. Oh, and I can not tell just how you felt when Jesus washed your sin, yes, your sins away, your sins away, but since that day, yeah, since that I, I God has been real, for I can feel His holy power, no, it's real. He's so real in my soul. Don't you know God is real? Before He has was and made me whole, and He is love for me. Is just like pig gold. Don't you know God is real? For I can feel Him in and well. Don't you know God's real? He's so real in my soul. Don't you know God is real? For He has washed and made me whole. And His love for me is just like pure gold. Don't you know God is real? For I can feel Him in my soul, Him in my soul. Let the church say amen. amen. Is God real to you today? Yes. Amen. I woke up this morning. Um, and I'm so glad that all of you woke up this morning. But the question, the question that I have for you today is when you woke up this morning, where was your mind? Uh, Brother Shamario just got through singing a song. I woke up this morning with my mind. See, some of you guys woke up this morning complaining. Some of you woke up this morning thinking about what happened yesterday. Some of you guys woke up this morning fretting about what's going to happen today. But as for me, and I hope for many of you that you woke up with your mind stayed or fixed on Jesus. When your mind is stayed or fixed on Jesus, it does not matter what happens in your life. You know, the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs and the variables of life are going to happen anyway. There's one thing that's constant about life and certain. And that is the fact that life is filled with uncertainties. And so, therefore, we understand the ebbs and flows of life. And we all have to go through those things. But when your mind is stayed or fixed on Jesus, you can handle whatever situation that the world throws at you. 
Why? It's not about you are a super person. It's because of the grace of God that gives you the wherewithal to stand. And once you've done all that you can do to stand, you stand, therefore. Keep on standing. Keep on keeping on. I want to invite you today. First of all, let me say good morning once again. And for those who, are to- who can't be here uh, and will be tuning in, we want to send our love your way as well. But for those of you who are under the sound of my voice, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John, and we're going to uh, use this passage that was read in your hearing uh, as we talk about uh, the idea of turning the page. Sometimes we have to just admit, you need to just turn the page. Have you ever read a good book? A good book? And they are divided by chapters. Life is a series of chapters. God says that he is the one who numbers. He he helps us to number our days. God has given us um, seasons. He's given us days, hours, and minutes. And all those are measuring rods, if you will, to measure your life. And as you go through life and as you measure your life, we have to understand that we are, see, God is a, uh, he is infinite. Is that right? He creates us and he places us in what's called time and space. God is eternal. See, God created time. Stay with me on this. This is not even my lesson, but I just, it just came on me to say this. So I'm going to say it anyway. God has created us in as much as he, first of all, has created time. For the Bible says, in the beginning, uh, the word was. And that word was gives us the understanding that in the beginning, God had been. In other words, In the beginning, however you measure the beginning, God was already there. That's right. That's right, right. right. And so, therefore, God created time, and he, as he placed us in a time-space capsule that we call the flesh, he has put us in time. And even though God created time, he is outside of time. He is not bound by time. He created time, but he stands apart from time because he is eternal. He made us uh, 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 to be uh, spiritual beings, but we are encapsulated in a time, space, flesh body. And therefore, we are bound by time. See, that again speaks to the wisdom of God. I didn't see this before. But do you not know that it's a blessing that God, when he created us, he placed us in time? Can you imagine having a headache in eternity? (laughs) Yeah, because God gives you uh, a time space existence while we're here. So when you have a headache, you have a hope that you won't have that headache tomorrow. As you turn the page from one day to the next, because we're not in eternity in our affliction, we're in time. But there is one great getting up morning when we will shed the temporal and the uh, material and we will step into tomorrow. We will step into eternity with God where there will be no sickness, uh, no sorrow, no pain, no strife. No wranglings. And all of that will just be peace in communion with God. If I want to kind of speak on that a little bit, now now my job is to tie all that into what my message is going to be, okay? Pray for me on this. Because we're talking about turning the page. In the next couple of days, next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about turning the page. And the only way you can really turn the page is by turning to God. I want to begin today just by making a few statements that I hope will serve to 
make sure we get this message today and that we can walk away from this message uh, with the ability to apply this message to our everyday walk. You see, there's something special about entering in to anything new. It can be a new house, a new car, a new job, new relationships, and yes, even, even a new year. Yeah. See, the new year seems to suggest that it's a fresh start. Uh -huh. I, I opened by saying, have you ever read a good book? And that book, you know, has an overarching theme, but it's broken down into chapters. And once you get the thought of one chapter, then you turn the page and it's another chapter. When you come out of one season, uh, you go into another season. When you go into out of one day, you go into another day. We call uh, today, what do you call today? Sunday. No, you call it today. <laughs> it happens to be Sunday. Amen. <laughs> what do you call yesterday? Yesterday. And what do you call tomorrow? Give me, it's not a trick question. Wow. Amen. Okay. And so, but when you get to tomorrow, guess what tomorrow is? Today. So tomorrow really never comes. It's always coming, but never getting here. Because once you step into tomorrow, you into what? Today. It tells us something about the eternality of God. God is eternal. Everything is right now with God. He sees it from the beginning from the end. That's the kind of God you serve. And I, I think this is going to have to be important to you today because today we're going to talk about you and I turning the page. And it starts by making a determination. The other day we talked about, you know, the importance of making resolutions. And we have kind of conditioned ourselves to say, well, I don't make resolutions anymore. Well, God is the God of resolutions. God, is, do you not know there's a time in, 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 in history where they called it, each 50-year span was called the year of what? Jubilee, right? If you owed a debt or some encumbrance uh, that, you know, you owed uh, on the year of Jubilee, the books were wiped clean. And you got a fresh start. I was in San Francisco and we had a, a recovery program. It was called Fresh Start. It was for people who had been incarcerated, or people who were dealing with uh, addictive behaviors and those kind of things. And as we ministered to them, we talked about it's time to make a fresh start. As we celebrated the new year, we said goodbye to the old and hello, hello to the new because we were looking at um, last year. It started out fresh, but as it went through, as you went through the year, uh, things happened. And those things that happen cause uh, growing pains and dents and rust and fragmentation and all that stuff. So uh, when 23 got to the end, it was wore out. And we were ready to say goodbye to 23 and hello to 24. And the reason why that is so significant, because God says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. God is able to make you new. He's able to give you a, a makeover. He is able to, 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 to take that which is old and uh, unsalvageable, and he's able to pick you up and to dust you off and to clean you up and put you in a new state of mind, a, stu a new state of being. And as we turn uh, the page of each year, we have a sense of expectation uh, with the beginning of a new year in your personal book of life. Your life is still being written. Yeah. Every day your, your life is being written. Is it a boring book? A sleeper? Or is your life filled with enthusiasm and vigor? Are you excited about each and every day? How would you wake up this morning? Did you wake up with, with your mind stayed on Jesus? Or did you wake up and make a decision? Well, I may go to church and I may not. It's five degrees out there. So now your allegiance and desire to worship God is being dictated by the temperature. Well, what about the temperature in your heart? See, that is the only thermostat that you need to be reading, a thermometer you need to be reading. Where is the zeal for God? Where is the passion to, to love and be loved by God? 
What is your determination? You know what this message is today? I am determined to walk with Jesus. I am determined to walk with God today. And when you are determined to do a thing, that begins to be the very uh, navigating force in your life. So as we talk about turning the page by turning to God, it starts by making a determination or a resolution. Hint, hint, clue, clue. I am determined to walk with God. That ought to be the, 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 the very basis of your purpose. Whatever individual ministry you engage in, it is a result of your determination to give your life to God. And now that is going to show up or manifest itself in different ways. But the overarching theme is the fact you've given yourself over to God. Take me and use me to your honor and to your glory. I don't know how you remember Isaiah. When Isaiah saw the, the brilliance and the majesty and splendor of God, he could not help but to see himself. He said, woe am I, for I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Remember that, that, that great confession he made? And then he beheld an angel uh, come flying uh, to the altar, and he took the thongs, tongs, okay, he took the tongs, don't misquote me, he, he took the tongs, and he got a coal and took that from the altar and touched him on his lips. In other words, symbolically, God says, you are now clean. You purged. You've been cleaned. And then God said, now, now who? Who will go for us and who uh, shall I send? And then he responded, here am I. Send me. But the intriguing thing about that is he did not ask, well, where do you want me to go? At first he says, here am I. Send me. And then, by the way, now where do you want me to go? That ought to be the attitude of each believer. Where he leads me, I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. I am placing him as the very center of my life, for he is the Lord of my life. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm down for it. I want us to understand that a resolution is simply a declaration. Either well thought out and well planned and well planned, prayed about declaration. It's a promise. It's a pledge to commit to certain attitudes and behavior that will produce certain outcomes and results. Notice a quote from C.H. Spurgeon. He said, the most of men have grown weary with the old cry of depression, of trade, and hard time. We are glad to escape from what has been to many uh, a 12 months of great trial. The last year has become wheezy, uh, choking, and decrepit in its old age. And we lay asleep, we lay it asleep with a psalm of judgment and mercy. We hope that this newborn year would not be worse than its predecessor. And we pray that it may be a great deal better. At any rate, it is new. And we are encouraged uh, to couple with it uh, the idea of happiness. As we say one to another, I wish you a happy new year. Notice, to what or to whom will you commit yourself? in 2024 and beyond. The power of your resolution is really embodied in to whom or to what you commit yourself. Because everybody in here is gonna commit yourself to something. It can be committing yourself to making sure you get home on time to watch the game, right? Like I did last night when I went home and watched the Chiefs play Miami. I committed to doing that. I, you know, I said, okay, the game come on such and And so I made sure that I got home and got in front of the TV in time to watch that game. Wrong with that. But in a deeper context, on a deeper level, to what or to whom are you going to commit yourself in this upcoming year? Now, don't all shout at the same time. I'm committing myself to God. 
I hope that is the case. But you know, that commitment and that declaration is going to manifest itself each and every day of your life as you go through this life. And you don't have to say a word. We watch, God says, I am watching you. You may be able to pull the wool over Brother Mary with his eyes. But who am I anyway but dust and britches or just like you? But God is the one to whom all worship and blessings ought to be directed. And that being the case, I make a resolve and a resolution today, a declaration, if you will, to who are you committing yourself? So today I want to show that uh, in order for any resolution to be real and lasting, it must be supported by a God-glorifying purpose. See, uh, any old resolution, you know, uh, the other day I, I said, you know, some people make a resolution to lose five pounds at the gym. Well, p go for it. But when we talk about a resolution that has eternal consequences, when I talk about a resolution that, that changes the very dynamic of your walk and your talk and how you begin to govern your life, that has to have its anchor in God. It has to be a God glorifying, a worthy purpose, a purpose that is bigger than you. It's not about you anyway, it's all about God. Amen. And once we begin to really embrace the fact that God is the one to whom we make the resolutions to, it is God who we make the promise to, it is God the one who, who we are saying, yes, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. And then God then obligates himself. And that blows me away. God said, I will obligate myself to bless you. Don't take my word for it. Read it, Malachi chapter 3. When he said, I want you to hold me accountable, put me to the test. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse and see when I open the windows of heaven and pour out a benediction or a blessing that is too big for you to handle. You can't outlive the blessings of God. We used to sing a song, you can't be God-given no matter how hard you try. In other words, he'll bless you so much and so profoundly that you can't outlive the blessings. The blessings have to spill over to your children and to your grandchildren and your whole posterity. Generational, he said, I'm going to bless you so much that even if you're dead, the blessings just keep on coming. That's right. That's right. And the way you live today, you'll be a blessing or a curse to your or whoever's coming behind you. Say that. Say that. It is what it is. So therefore, this resolution that you make, however you want to live your life, it gets its potency based on the, the to whom or to which you are resolving to live for. And so therefore, I won't today that we will make a lifelong resolution to walk with God. Again, I am determined to walk with God. I have decided to follow Jesus. And therefore, when you make that decision, that definitive statement, there is no turning back. And for emphasis say, sake, I say no, no turning back. Now, let's get into this passage. Contextually, John, in, in our Bible studies, Wednesday night Bible studies a couple of weeks ago, we began to talk about uh, the reason for John's epistles. How he saw it necessary to combat some false teaching that was swirling around. And this false teaching were, was, it was so multifaceted. There are so many shades of it. And to, to, to put it in a one phrase kind of capsulization, I would say it was a spirit of Gnosticism. Gnosticism, coming from the word gnosis, meaning to know. And there were those who were saying that we have, you know, we have reached a higher zenith of knowledge and spiritual revelation and insight. And therefore, we don't need, uh, we don't need this word because we have received a higher word and now we are above we are above the apostolic teachings and now we can now begin to do different things how we want to do it because we have uh, uh um reached a certain apex of wisdom and knowledge and so john begins to write this particular epistle uh to combat all of that foolishness all that false teaching 
And so therefore, when we look at this, we see that as he uh, is trying to deal with those who claim to have special insight and revelation, which allowed them to live against the ethical standards of the kingdom of God. Am I talking too fast? See, the Gnostics were against, uh, the Gnostics against uh, whose error is supposed to be uh, Suppose this epistle to be written for. And the nearest communion and fellowship of holiness, they said we have fellowship with God, even though we're not living in harmony with some of the things that the Bible is saying we ought to do. <sighs> Please come to Bible class and we'll get more of that. But suffice to say right now, because they were saying they had divine illumination uh, and they had... Uh, drank from the fountain, the communion fountain of holiness, while their manner, uh, their manners were excessively corrupt. They were saying they were what they called the antinomians. Uh, in other words, anti against, nomos mean law, they were the lawless ones. They were not adhering to the ethics of the kingdom. They were not adhering to the laws of God. They were above all of that. And John had to set the record straight. And so therefore, he gives, I'm going to give you three things today. Um, there needs to be a motivation uh, that helps to determine my declaration. So the first point, the point of origin of our determination, the first thing I want to give. If I'm saying I'm determined to walk with God, well, where did they come from? What is the origin of that determination? What is the point of origin? Well, in verse number five, it tells us the point of origin. You see, we must, uh, uh, it determines what must we understand about the character of God. There's something about the character of God that will empower us to make such a resolution or such a commitment. There has to be something about the holiness of God uh, that I see and understand. And that makes me want to be holy as well. For the Bible says, be ye what? Holy as he is holy, right? And so there's something about God that we have to tap into so that we can, if we are modeling ourselves after God, we're going to be walking the, holy, the highway of holiness ourselves. Now notice the text. It says, starting at verse number five, he said, this then, well, when he said this then, let me, let me back up. Verse number one says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you the eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. The apostle says there was something was manifested to us, that which was with the father. And so he says that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. And then in verse number five, he says, this then, this is the message. This is the message uh, which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. I want to start right now. The first declaration, the first, uh, the first hook or anchor in which we make our declaration is based on the holiness of God. He says, first of all, I want to give a certainty, write this down, a certainty of the message of Christ. He said, we were eyewitnesses, John and the apostles, they were uh, eyewitnesses to uh, the word of life. He said, we have handled this, we have seen, we have uh, looked upon. As a matter of fact, we have been in communion with this message as given to us by Jesus. This message which we have heard of him. And now this very message we're declaring uh, to you that God is light. We were the eyewitnesses, the apostles were, and we've heard uh, from him, from the word of life. And now we deliver this message to you. And what is the message? What is the essence of the message? The essence of this message, the grand principle on which all of us depend is this one thing. Get this or you don't get anything. God is light. But Brother Meriwether, what do you mean by God is light? It, it simply means that God is light. God is 100% moral perfection. 
God can't get any more godly than he already is. God is God. God is light. God is 100% more. We talk about morality here. He's 100% moral perfection. Moral completely. He's already there. He is indeed the standard by which everything is measured. He's not trying to get a little bit better. He's already there. God is God all by himself. He doesn't, need, he doesn't need your agreement to be any more or less God. He said, now we have come to understand that. And we are declaring it to you. We're giving you the essence of the message. And that is the grand message upon which your life depends. God is 100% moral perfection. There is no uh, variance. This talks about the veracity of God. The veracity of God. Uh, the truth of God. He is the essence of wisdom. He is the essence of knowledge. He is the essence of love. He is the essence of righteousness. God is the standard. God is light. God is light. Notice. Notice the reality of this message. If God is light, guess what? In him there is no darkness at all. Okay? You can't have both. If he is light, then that means he is, there is no darkness in him at all. That is the reality. There's no wavering. There's no inconsistency in God. And so therefore, when you make your resolution to walk uh, in the right way, based, it is based upon the veracity or the holiness of God. So we ought to make resolutions that are not some whimsical thing that we decide on, you know, the first day of the year. And by the end of the first week of the year, we're doing something else. <laughs> but when your resolution is anchored in the very veracity of God, the righteousness of God, and everything that you do is based upon and depends upon uh, your relationship with him who is righteous. And it makes you say yes to God. It makes you say no to temptation. See, that's why we give in to so much stuff. Because you haven't said yes to God yet. Oops. See, when you say yes to God, he becomes first place. Everything else is by necessity becomes what? Second place. And it shows up in every nook and cranny of your life. Yeah, and th th therefore, it's no longer a, an idea of prioritizing and putting God as somewhere on your list. Not even first on your list. Because God is the list. Everything you do has to be based upon your relationship with God. And when everything that you do is based upon your relationship with God, now you're living in kingdom purpose. Now you're li living in terms of kingdom purpose, kingdom direction. And everything that you're about is about glorifying God. And so, therefore, if there's a certain ministry that you think, think need to be done in this church, that the church is not doing, well, do it. I was walking in the hall today, and I saw on the, on the bulletin board, I saw the Murphys had a picture. They have become the poster child uh, for, for cancer. Uh, is that, that is your picture on that? On that. Was that you? <laughs> there, there, there's little, little, some posters, that, the flyers that you send out by the Cancer Society, right? And the Murphy's face is on there. They're committing themselves to be champions of, you know, prevention of certain cancers. I, I appreciate that. Amen. There, 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 sometimes if there's a ministry you think needs to be done and we're not doing it, we'll do it. You know? I know, I know uh, the Pattersons are talking about doing, have a, some teen summits. That means my daughter, she just turned 13, she can go. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> and, and then the Galettes are doing a recovery ministry. But there are dozens of other ministries that are lying dormant within you, waiting to come out and being championed by you. But all you need to do, first of all, is see God in the right way. When you see the holiness of God, you can't say, help but say, woe am I. I need God. 
here am I, send me and use me to your honor and to your glory. And wherever you send, I will go. It's as simple as that. Notice. Notice this. If we walk with God, we must walk in the light. Okay? See, see, those Gnostics were saying, we're walking with God. Although it was evident that they were not walking in the light. Yeah. Oh, really? If you would walk with God, that means by necessity, you must be walking in the light. We must be people of kingdom character, led by a kingdom vision of love, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. In turn, you will be a new and improved person. See, we're talking about waiting for the new year and rejoicing in the new year. Don't worry about the new year. You be a new you. See, sometimes we go into the new year bringing the same old junk, the same old stuff, the same old attitude, the same old behavior, the same old chip on your shoulders as you had last year. Worrying about the same thing that you can't do anything to control anyway. Be a new you. For the Bible says if you're in Christ, you are what? A new creature anyway. Amen. Come on, guys. Let's do this. Notice. Not only do we, we, we see that there has to be a point of origin for this declaration, but then what is the proof of the declaration? Everybody say, I'm, I love Jesus and I, I love God, and, and, but what is the evidence? How does that manifest itself in your life? What is the evidence of your fellowship with God? And what is the benefit of that fellowship? If you're in fellowship with God, that means everybody around you are being blessed by virtue of you being in close proximity to them. Amen. Amen. Who's being blessed? Because you're in the room. I get on the plane and I ain't trying to say nothing. But, you know, I, I say my prayer before the plane take off and then I'm good. And I know everybody on the plane, they safe now because I'm on that plane with them. Right. Why hasn't God just shut this thing down already? Because of saints. I know y'all don't believe you, me, but let me call to the witness stand a good friend of mine. Uh, his name, his name is Abraham. Abraham had a nephew. You know, sometimes we have nephews who get in trouble, get all jacked up. And his nephew, by the name of Lot, had found himself dwelling in Sodom. You know the story but between, you know, that whole story. I'm not getting into a whole bunch of that. But he chose to go toward Sodom. And he got closer and closer to Sodom until he found himself in Sodom. And eventually Sodom was in him. And so the angel came. He said, I'm going to destroy, you know, these, these cities here. And I can't do it without telling my friend Abraham what I'm going to do. So he told Abram that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and those other cities, surrounding cities. And then uh, Abraham began to plead with God to relent. That's right. He said, don't do this, don't do this. He said, you know, I got to do what I'm, gonna, I'm doing, what I'm going to do. I have purposed. I made a resolution that I'm going to do this. And he said, but what about the righteous? He said, God, God, if you found 50 righteous men in that city, would you still destroy it? You know, the righteous have to die. He said, I, based on what you said, if I find 50 righteous, I will not destroy the city. Right. Abram knew he bit off more than he could chew. <laughs> he said, prevention, he said, you know, I, I don't want to be pushy. But if you found 40 righteous, would you spare the city for the sake of those 40 righteous? And he said, yeah, I, I will. Not a problem. I'm, I'm, I, I will relent. Okay, I, I'm, I'm going to take care. I'm going to handle my business. And he told you, wait, 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 wait. But what if you, you know, you know d d forgive me. You know, I don't want to be pushy. But what if you found 30? And then what if you found 20? Oh, no, he kept, he kept <laughs> how many did he find? Some people say, well, he found, only found Lot. Well, he, how did Lot leave the city? He had to snatch Lot. 
He didn't find one righteous one, even Lot and his family. See, none of us, there's none righteous, no, not one. It is the grace of God that saves us, not your goodness, not how large you think you are. He had to go and snatch a lot by the collar and drag him, kicking and screaming, out of that city. And then he said, you know, well, come with us. He said, no, can we just go over there? He said, well, go ahead, run, and don't turn back. I ain't want to preach on that, but I just want to say, I'm trying to say something, that your presence, if you live a life of righteousness, God will forgive, not, not forgive, not, not this, I don't want to mix this up in terms of uh, salvation, but do you not know, uh, was it John 7, talking about how the unbelieving husband and children are sanctified by the believing spouse. Yeah. Do you not know your children will be sanctified, set apart? Don't conflate that with salvation because everyone has to be saved based on their own personal. So you can't be saved by your mama's and your grandma's religion. That old time, it was, no, 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 no. You got to come to God for yourself. Amen. But the, when he said you will be it's sanctified, that whole house will be blessed. You can bring blessings to others. A whole lot of folk didn't get taken out because you had a great grandmother who was praying for you. You didn't even know it. You were like out there shooting dice and smoking weed and, you know, getting high and, and living large and doing everything you thought you was big enough to do. But you had a great grandmother who was on her knees praying for you, interceding for you. And God relented and allowed you to stay a little longer so you could hear the gospel for yourself. Notice this. I'm going to now I want you to listen fast. I'm going to speak at a faster clip. The proof of this, notice what the Bible says in verses 6 and 7. Okay? Make sure that you're in the text. Are you there? He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, he says, that's a contradiction. He said, we lie and do not the truth. He goes on to say, but if we walk in the light, and every time I talk about this verse, I have to talk about the word walk as a present tense verb in the Greek. In other words, it means a present tense verb simply means it's, it, it, it's continuous action. If you are walking in the light, uh, I often say that salvation is not based on the perfection of your walk, but the direction of your walk. Is that all right? So therefore he says, if we walk in, if we are walking you may fall, you may stumble every now and then, but you keep on walking in the light. That is your conversation. That word conversation, your, your manner of life, and your, your purpose in life, your determination in life. If you're walking in the light, um, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one. See, I want to talk about the vertical and horizontal impact of your declaration to follow God. Okay? He said, we, if, you, if you walk in the light, if he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, clean, uh, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, uh, first of all, denial brings destruction, both physical and spiritual. Hello, hello, hello. If you say that you have fellowship with God and are walking in darkness, you know, you're bringing destruction on yourself. See, the reality of the gospel is found in Romans chapter 3 and 23. that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No ifs, ands, buts about it. We all need Jesus. I don't care how good you think you are. You need Jesus. We all need Jesus. He said the reality of the gospel is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, there is a universal problem, and that is brought on by... Uh, uh, the, the, by Adam, and that is death or separation from God. That's physical. But when you sin, do you not know you bring yourself into a severed relationship with God? Sin cuts you off. We are now separated from God because of sin. We need someone who's able to bridge the gap. Jesus is the only one who's able to step in and be the satisfactory. We use that word propitiation, right? Uh, brother, brother, uh, uh, um, brother uh, McIntosh 
uh, read from Psalms, uh, uh, Isaiah 53, talking about the suffering servant. If he would have read a little bit further, when he talked about by his stripes, we are healed, right? That, the, that God will look up on his suffering and be pleased. In other words, the, 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 the hostility has now been appeased. Yes. Payment in full because of the blood of Jesus. Right. Payment in full. That word, that word of propitiation, uh, it goes back to uh, the idea of the mercy seat. The mercy seat, you know, we had the Ark of the Covenant, right? Right, 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 right. Okay, we had the Ark of the Covenant, and in the Ark of the Covenant, we had, you know, some of the manna, right? We had the, that bud, that, that rod that budded, and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were in the Ark of the Covenant, and we couldn't live about it, but guess what? They, they put a covering over it. Woo! Aren't you glad that there was a covering put on the thing? So all that, the, the, the Ten Commandments said, you guilty, you guilty, you guilty, and therefore, because you're guilty, you must die. And they put a covering on They call it the mercy seat. Yeah. That word propitiation means he is the mercy seat. He's the covering. Right. Because of the blood of Jesus, your sins have been covered. Yeah. I don't know what that do for you, but it gives me goosebumps big enough to hang my hat on. Just to understand how God uh, covers us. Uh, notice what he says. One profession must match your possession. He said, if we say, right? You see that? If we are saying that we are this, that, or the other. See, one's practice reveals the sincerity of your conviction. He said, if we say this, yet we walk in darkness, you're lying. You see, your fellowship with God will prove beneficial not only to yourself, but to everyone around you. If we walk in the light, see, that brings in a horizontal fellowship. You see, when I'm striving to walk in the light, and, and, and this brother's trying to walk in the light, we can be in agreement with one another. We can be in fellowship with one another. See, God is so great, he's able to deal with the, 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 the problems of interpersonal relationships uh, by dealing with the problem in the vertical. See, he deals with the vertical, notice what and the blood of Jesus. You see that? And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. See, when you get the horizontal, uh, uh, your vertical relationship together, that makes it easier for you to get the horizontal relationship together. Yeah. Notice, there are ethical implications of walking in the light as he is in the light. There must be a distinguishing factor that separates the believer from unbelievers. See, we live in this postmodern world, this world of modernity where everything is so relative, you can't distinguish what a believer is and what a believer is not. So everybody running around saying, I'm a believer. I believe the Bible and I believe that. Well, let's get into a Bible study because I'm not going to say that you are not this, that, or the other, but let's let the word of God begin to give understanding and illumination. Because like the Gnostics, everybody running around talking about, well, I love God and I'm this and I'm that. Well, what does the Bible say? Let's deal with this confusion and, and, and all, these different, uh, all this different ambiguity that's floating around in here. Um, kingdom people make a conscious decision to walk with God in every situation. Let me say that again. I don't care what your building say on your marquee. Kingdom people make a conscious effort to put God first in every decision in their life, okay? And let me give you this and the lesson to be yours. I want to talk about the practical implications of our declaration or of our resolution. It has to have a practical implication. In other words, once you made this declaration, I'm going to follow Jesus and all that, but then it has to be able to, to show up in your life, in your everyday walk. How does being a Christian show up? in your everyday circumstances, in your casual walk through life, how is your resolution to follow Jesus going to show up? Notice in verse eight through 10, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, but verse nine says, if we confess our sins, 
uh, the brother who spoke on last Lord's Day, he talked about that word confession, homo legeo, right? Which is, means uh, to, uh, 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 homo means same, logos means word or to speak, to say. It means to speak the same or to harmonize with what God is saying or to agree with God or to say amen to what God is saying in your life. So I'm not carried worried about whether or not you say amen. I want your life to be an amen. amen. That's what it's all about. And yes, you can say amen if you want to. Thank you so much. But the bottom line, the bottom line is uh, denial brings destruction. Okay? Denial brings destruction. Um, but it results in being void of truth. But the good thing about it is it says... If we confess, if we agree with God, he is faithful and just to forgive us. See, you can't get forgiveness if you desire, de, de, deny the fact that you sin. Hello? Sometimes we can't get forgiveness because we're still denying. You know, we're still trying to blame somebody else. So they were saying, we have not sinned. Jesus said, though, only those who are sick need a physician. And since you say that you are already well, then you don't need me. Okay? But when you come clean with the fact that you have sinned, that you're hurting, that there's areas in your life that need to be given over to God, that when you agree, then he said, guess what? He is faithful. Aren't you glad that you serve a God who's faithful? Even when you're unfaithful, he is still faithful. And your unfaithfulness does not negate his faithfulness. Right. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. Let that perfect tense verb again. To keep on cleansing us. To keep on forgiving us. To keep on removing our sin from a, as far as the east is from the west. That's how far he removes our sins from us. That's right. God is a good God. He's able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I looked up the word all. I needed to understand it. Do you know what the word all really means? It means all. <laughs> Point blank period. He's able to forgive us of all unrighteousness. I don't, see, we try to quantify and, and begin to measure, you know, this sin and that sin. You know what? God says, please. You know, even in your most righteous day, it's like a filthy rag in, the, in, 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 in comparison to my righteousness. So let's all just get a hint, hint, clue, clue, and just deny all that stuff and give your life to God. And it's by the grace of God anyway, because it's not based on your righteous performance. Because Brother Merriweather continues to miss it. If, if I can fool you as, as though I get it all right, then ask my kids. They'll tell you I make mistakes. And I don't want to hear any of them saying amen right now. <laughs> amen. <laughs> Finally, as I close, I want to let you guys go. He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the word, his word is not in us. Notice, and his word. And his word is not in us. In, in that small little book called Jude. In a small little book called Jude, the Bible says that we ought to do what? Earnestly contend for the faith. The definite article, faith. Not a faith, but the faith. See, it's one thing for you to say, I have faith in God. But it's a different thing to say, I'm walking in the faith of God. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I have faith, but, I, but salvation is based on whether you are in the faith. And so, therefore, I, the appeal is, it is the birthright of every child of God to be cleansed from all sins. You see, that's God's work. That's God's work. To keep him unspotted from the world and so to live as a... Uh, Never more to offend his maker. See, when you say, I repent, and I want to give my life, what you're saying, I, I, I promise God that I will not sin anymore. I'm done. That's why in the next chapter, he says, my little children, I write these things that you sin not. He said, but if you do sin, 
because you're still in this humanness. Just understand you have an advocate with the Father. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you have someone who's pleading your case for you. Okay? When you say, I repent, you're saying, I declare, I, I pledge not to do it again. But in your flesh, we still sometimes stumble and fall. But in your heart, in your heart is saying, I'm done. See, because everybody who said, I want to become a Christian, you said, I want to be joined with God. I want to divorce myself from the ways of the world. That's what you're saying, right? That's your declaration. That's your resolution. Everyone who becomes a Christian, you already made a resolution to, to live for God. But you see, in this time and space capsule we call the flesh, we sometimes miss the mark. Okay? And that's why we need the grace of God. It's through the grace of God that we're able to say that. It's because of the grace of God that we're able to do that. It's because of the grace of God. Not us, but God's grace. None of this stuff is contingent on your performance. How pathetic would that be? It's on the grace of God. The integrity, the veracity of God. See, we're talking about making a resolution that's going to stick. Now, let me give you some things as we close. Okay? If you are determined to walk with God. How many of you say, I'm determined to walk with God? I mean, I'm, de I'm determined to walk with God. Okay? Now, let me give you some tools. Okay? We need some tools. Not just a sermon, but we need some tools to help you to accomplish that. Number one, get in a relationship with another Christian. For prayer. And fellowship, and underline this word, and accountability. Okay? If you want to be real in this resolution, and I'm going to make a suggestion. You don't have to do this. I'm making a suggestion that it's not with your spouse. It can be with your spouse. Nothing wrong with that. But I want to broaden this thing a little bit and make the church begin to interact with one another. Get into some kind of group. Maybe a small group or another person. And you guys come together for the purpose of prayer. Yeah, for fellowship. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the purpose of uh, uh, accountability to one another. I told you about a good friend of mine, Derek Fortune, right? We used to go work out together back in the day when I was little. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Where's Derek Fortune? I need him now. Uh, but we used to get together at 6 o'clock in the morning. We, go, we meet at the gym and we work out. And so some days I didn't want to get up. But I knew Derek Fortune was going to be there. So because of my accountability promise to him, I got up anyway and went to the gym at 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay? When I ran my marathon, we, ha we had to meet up uh, 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 over at Belboa Park. This is in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. And, and we, a whole group of us who were training, and I had to get there. Sometimes we go to Santa Monica Pier and run the pier and run in the sand, all that kind of stuff, right? And I would get there. On time. In order to get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, guess what? We had, I had to get up at 5 something, right? There's nothing about Gino Merriweather. They want to get out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning. It's still nighttime, right? But because of the commitment uh, and the covenant that we entered into and for the accountability, I got there. When you have somebody who is holding you accountable and you are holding them accountable, do you not know both of you guys can grow? We're talking about making resolutions that stick. We're talking about getting in harmony with God and God puts us. That's why you, when you got baptized into Christ, God didn't just wish you on the way to heaven. He kept you in the church. And it's in the church that we begin to work out our soul salvation. God has worked something into you. It's now up to you to work it out. And he puts you in here with other believers to hold yourself accountable to one another. See, we are the church. We are the ecclesia or the ecclesia. We have been called out of the world, but we have now been called in to a community here on earth called the church. And we are in here for one another. So I'm tired of you guys not being, don't like one another, mad at one another. All lips all stuck out with one another. Ready to leave the church because somebody didn't say hello to you today. Well, they had something else on their mind. You didn't say hello to them either. Oops. <laughs> so get in that kind of written. Number two, number two, write this down, write it down. Develop a daily Bible reading and prayer regimen. Now I want to give a uh, shout out to, um, I, think, I don't know if it's Brother and Sister Murphy who sends out those, those daily devotionals. But to help you wake up and get your mind squared away where it needs to be. 
You know, get you a daily Bible reading program. You might start off with maybe 15 minutes a day and let that expand. But start somewhere studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, absorbing yourself in the Word of God. Number three, number three, commit to regular public worship and Bible study. A lot of us are so anemic in the area of Bible study that it's not even funny. And you say, well, I already know all that stuff. Well, then we really need you there to help us who don't know. Uh Uh-huh. For for those of you who are mature, who are the stronger brother, we need you there because we weak. Regular worship. Notice, practice sacrificial giving of your time, of your talent, and your treasure. Sacrificial giving. Giving not just what's left over, but giving because it, it it is a sacrifice. See, God gave his best. When we were at our worst, God so loved the world that he gave his son. He set the bar. He set the standard. So he's not saying when we, when we talk about giving of our means, we ain't talking about just giving a little bit something, something. No. Do you not know that in biblical numerology, the word, the word tithe comes from the word tenth, right? Um, in biblical numerology, tenth was representative of the whole. So when they gave that tenth, what they were really saying is, God, I'm giving my all to you. I'm not giving you my leftovers. I'm not giving you a little piece. I'm giving you my all in all. Shows your trust in God. Shows your dependence on God. Shows your faith in God. And then finally, become involved in a ministry in the church that impacts the community. And when I say that it impacts the community, first of all, that impacts this local community of faith, but also impacts the larger community on the outside. So when you commit to those five things, those five things, you are on pace to keeping uh, this commandment, uh, to keeping this resolution. Turning the page starts by turning to God. And you're able to say that I am determined to walk with God and I'm practicing these five steps that keep me on track. Not only in this year, 24, but throughout my life. So if you're here today and you need to make a resolution to give your life to Jesus, it starts by saying, I first of all have to come to the realization that I am separated from him because because of sin and i now want to give my life to him i want to denounce the old life i want to turn i want to turn to god i'm saying no to this old world and this old way i'm saying yes to jesus i understand that he is the solution to my problem and the problem is i've sinned i'm confessing that I'm coming clean. I am agreeing with God. God sees me, and he knows that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you know what we say? You're right, God, I've sinned. But I'm repenting of that. I'm turning, and now I want to give my life to you. I'm confessing you as Lord. I want to now submit to you in baptism for, for the remission of my sins. And then adds me to the body, which is the church. And then I live faithful even until the last day on this earth as I turn into eternity. Don't you want to go where Jesus is? Don't you want to be with God? Don't you want to give your life to him? Don't you want to turn the page? I don't care what happened last year or yesterday. You can turn the page today by giving your life to him. And just think about that and respond to it as together we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Ooh, ooh, ooh.